Hello, I'm Ed Fuquay, Young Adult Librarian Extraordinaire here at Woonsocket Harris Public Library. And I'm Miss Gabby from the Children's Department. And we're here for another episode of Book Talking, the, the series where we talk about mostly not books, but some, sometimes books. <laughs> um, today we're talking about Greek heroes. Now, last week we talked about the Greek gods. Yes. What do you think of the Greek gods? I think that, I don't know, they're, they're all messed up in their own little way. They are. They're yeah. very screwed up. They're, um, they're cherished and um, praised, but at the same time, no, they're all very mean and messed up. Yeah, by modern standards, they're very problematic. Yes, very. Um, so, and however, they're like a real bowl of cherries compared to the Greek heroes. Really? Today we're going to talk about the Greek heroes. These are the guys who are immortalized in story and song, and they became the basis for the whole cycle of heroes that we have today. Superheroes are inspired by them. Um, their stories have been told and retold again and again, and for the most part, the Greek heroes are all horrible people. Yeah, not surprised. Yeah, honestly. it's yeah, they're jerks. It's, it's, <laughs> there is absolutely no way around it. Some are worse than others, though. So we're going to talk about the three biggest defenders today. Okay. Also, the three greatest heroes of, <laughs> of Greek mythology. Um, they're all kind of famous. Um, the first one, the like earliest hero, uh, is Perseus. Yes, I've heard about. Familiar with him? I am. What do you know about Perseus? Uh, I just know from like the movies and everything, kind of like the, the basics. Yes, well he starred in like two popular films, or one popular film that's been made twice, was Clash of the Titans. Yeah. So, um, so he did became famous for that. Apart from, the, apart from Clash of the Titans, he wasn't that famous, at least in modern times. Um, uh, he was the uh, offspring of the god Zeus, mm -hmm. an immortal woman, a Danai. Um, uh, she was um, not forcibly taken by Zeus, so that's good. Yeah. That's, that's a point her, in uh, Zeus's favor. Um, her father, because of a prophecy that, uh, that the sun would turn out to kill him, did lock her up in a tower that no one was allowed into, except for a narrow slit that light came into. So Zeus kind of like turned into a beam of, of energy or light or something to come in. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Zeus gets around. Not going to let a little thing like that stop him. Nope, not right. Yeah. So, um, Years later, uh, Perseus was pricked on a quest to go kill the Medusa, um, which he did. Now, the Medusa was a woman who was uh, cursed. She became a monster with snake for hair and uh, could turn people to stone, famously. Um, originally, she was just a normal-looking woman with snake hair. Yeah. Like, she was even really beautiful in many depictions. In the way that I, like, when I heard it, I heard that she was kind of just, like, cursed, and she was beautiful, and because that someone cursed her enough to, like, to do that so no man will ever look at her again because she slept with someone's husband? Um, actually, it's even worse than that. Is it? Yeah. Okay. She was actually forcibly taken by the god Poseidon oh. in a temple of Athena. And Athena was so offended, offended by that that she cursed the girl. Wow. So it wasn't even her fault in any way. So she has every right to be bitter. Um, in many modern retellings, she's kind of the, the anti-hero of the story. Mm -hmm. Really, everything bad mm -hmm. happened to her for no reason. It was not her fault. She was cursed with this hideous curse, um, head full of snakes, changed people to stone. Um, but by Greek standards, she's a monster that has to be killed. Yeah. Um, so you couldn't look at it without turning to stone. So Perseus, in some versions of the story, with help from the goddess Athena, um, he abused her image in a highly polished bronze shield so he could sneak up on her and cut off her head that way. Um, to make the climax of the movies more dramatic, um, she shoots a bow and arrow at Perseus, and she's also her body is half snake to make her more dangerous. Um, in the actual Greek story, she just has normal legs and doesn't yeah. really attack Perseus. There's even some versions where he sneaks up when she's asleep. So that's so our hero. That, that's Perseus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now on the way back from that, and in some versions, he gets the winged horse Pegasus by doing that. Although there's another entire story about how Pegasus came to be, but in some version of the story, Perseus has a winged horse named Pegasus that he uses to fly back, and along the way he stops by and saves a princess named Andromeda from being killed by a dragon, okay. you know, as one does. Yeah. Um, the story of Andromeda is only slightly messed up. Um, it's always described as a dragon in most of the stories, uh, but for some reason in the movies it was replaced by a kraken is a technical monster that wasn't yeah. in the original story. Um, so who really knows what was going on with that one? <laughs> but uh, Andromeda became the prototype for every princess that has to be rescued by a big manly man. Of 
So literally every princess ever. Pretty much yeah. every princess ever throughout history since then. Yeah. Andromeda was like a template for that. So yeah, she did not set a good precedent. <laughs> um, so Perseus in the timeline was followed by Theseus. Uh, Theseus did a lot more things um, and was an even bigger jerk. Um, I have a question. Yes. Do they just increasingly become more and more like mean and jerky? Kind of. I yeah. don't know. The, um, the people who actually told these stories all believe they happened in the ancient past. Okay. Because most of the stories end with a hero founding a city. And it happens to be the city that you're living in right now. Oh. Almost all of them end yeah. with them founding a city or starting a country or something like that. Yeah. And so they're origin myths. Um, everybody in Greece wanted to believe that they were descended, however distantly, from some hero who had the blood of the gods in them and was capable of doing all these amazing things. Weren't they also considered demigods, right? They were demigods, yes. Yeah. You were half god and half mortal, you were demigod. Uh, like the most famous demigod in modern times is Percy Jackson. And Percy is actually named after Perseus. Mm. Yeah, Percy is short yeah. Perseus. Um, fortunately, he's nothing like it is his Greek historical <laughs> counterpart. Um, that'd be a terrible series of books, which we would never have written them. Um, so Theseus was on his way to the country that his father ruled. He was um, born illegitimately and went to claim his birthright. He had a whole series of adventures on the way there. Uh, he had to kill a wild bull, he killed a wild boar, um, both of which things that Hercules would later do. Yeah. They echoed each other quite a bit, and some versions of the story actually became friends. So they had stories that paralleled each other. Um, he also had to go through a whole series of stories where he passed a series of tests to defeat one monster after another. There was a giant who um, was, was, uh, came from Mother Earth and therefore could always regain his strength whenever he was in contact with the ground. And so Theseus had to beat him by lifting him in the air so his feet were off the ground and then and get him in a chokehold to subdue him. <laughs> hey, it was random stuff. Yeah, random stuff. Well, they consider that to be the origin of like Greco-Roman wrestling. Oh, really? So the origin of like Olympic wrestling is right there. <laughs> yep, Theseus lifting up that guy and holding him up in the air. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anyways, he goes to the country where he's a prince and when he gets there, they have a huge problem. Um, the city of Athens had been defeated by Crete. King Minos of Crete had defeated them, and as part of the reparations they had to pay after losing the war is, they had to give up um, seven boys and seven girls who would go off um, to be fed to the Minotaur. And those were known as tributes. Now if the word tribute sounds familiar, that's because that's where the idea for Hunger Games comes from. That was what inspired Suzanne Collins to write Hunger Games. Um, Hunger Games is kind of loosely based off of the Greek gods and goddesses? Exactly. Oh wow, I never that knew that. That's his original inspiration. Yeah, because Athens would be forced to pick like seven boys and seven girls, like teenagers, okay. and send them off to fight the Minotaur. Actually, get killed by the Minotaur because they were sent in after this monster with like no weapons or mm -hmm. anything. Um, the Minotaur was a creature that was half bull and half man. Mm -hmm. It was hugely strong, it ate human flesh, razor sharp horns, that kind of thing. Why it ate human flesh? Because neither men in particular nor bulls, bulls eat grass, let's face it. Yeah. But Rather than being calm and placid Ferdinand kind of bull, yeah, he was half of a mean, angry, flesh-eating bull. Um, he was technically half of a bull that was created by Poseidon. Okay. So again, the gods yeah. just can't stop meddling in mortal affairs, and it always ends up disastrously bad. So he went to Crete. Now, uh, it was ruled by King Minos at the time, and um, uh, the Minotaur was kept in a thing known as the Labyrinth. Yeah. And the labyrinth was sort of like an elaborate maze. Um, and the island of Crete has been excavated by archaeologists, and they found some of the things mentioned in this story are actually there. Mm -hmm. There was a labyrinth there. Really? Yeah. I'm sure there's probably no minotaur, but the maze was an important symbol to, to their, um, their history and, and probably their religion, too. And they worship bulls there. Oh, yeah. I have friends that are, um, that are from, like, that believe in the same religion. And um, they even told me that when they were little, their parents used to even tell them, like, if you don't like behave, we're going to send you with him. And then, you know, they kind of used that as like a scaring tactic. Yeah. Um, a labyrinth is technically different from a maze, even though the words are used interchangeably frequently in English. Mm -hmm. um, a maze is a path you have to go through. A maze will have dead ends and false turns and things like that. A labyrinth is one continuous journey. It may be twisty and go around and around in a circuitous yeah. fashion, but it, eventually there are no dead ends in a labyrinth. You just have to be able to walk the labyrinth to get to the middle of it and then walk backwards to reach the end. Backwards? Um, to get out again. Oh, okay. Um, 
but the thing is, so um, Theseus, of course, being a, a Greek demigod, okay. uh, wasn't going to take anything for granted. Um, so he cheated. Um, first of all, despite the fact that you're not you're supposed to go against the Minotaur without any weapons, he smuggled in a sword. And I'm, I'm picturing him with like a loincloth or something. Like, yeah. how do you smuggle a sword? I mean, really. <laughs> Plus, it's not like everybody should have tried that. So you think <laughs> they'd be on guard for that, but no, he somehow brought in a sword. Um, and also, the princess uh, of the island mm -hmm. saw him, and of course, fell in love with him at first sight. Okay. Yeah. So that's how old that cliche is. Yeah. And the princess fell in love with him and decided to betray her father and this like culture that her custom had. And uh, she went to Daedalus, a designer of the labyrinth, to try to find a way that Theseus could escape from the labyrinth. And so what Daedalus eventually gave her, um, Daedalus was a brilliant inventor, mm -hmm. um, he eventually gave her a long spool of thread, uh, which she gave to Theseus. And when Theseus went in the labyrinth, he tied the end of it to the door, basically, yeah. and then trailed the thread out behind him. Oh. So that way he could just walk and follow the thread back. Yeah, wow. So he smuggled in both a sword and a ball of thread. He uh, very much cheated then. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> um, Theseus is also, so he defeated the, the Minotaur um, and uh, married Ariadne in some version of the story. Mm -hmm. He's one of those heroes that has several different contradictory things said about him. If you start researching him, there's a lot of confusion and contradictions. Um, in some versions, he does not marry Ariadne, in some versions, he does. There's a whole cycle of stories where he marries someone else. Um, there is a set of there's a version of the story in which she marries Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons, after she's been beaten by Hercules, wow. um, and they have a child together who plays a part in another like you know whole mid cycle. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Theseus is kind of his adventures are kind of nebulous. His high spot was killing the Minotaur. <laughs> it was all downhill from there. Uh, there's even three or four different versions of how he died. Wow. Nobody really knows. Um, so his story gets kind of fuzzy. Um, he was Athens' big hero though. Um, yes, that was where he was mostly worshipped, had the most temples to him and things like that. But the big guy whom I just mentioned of Greek mythology is Hercules. Hercules! Yeah, everybody's heard of Hercules. He is the most famous character from Greek mythology. Yeah. Even more famous than his father Zeus. Um, the problem with Hercules is, like all these guys, you have to yeah. file away a lot of details to make his story <laughs> even remotely right. And even then, it's tough. Yeah. It is so tough because he because was just an the, awful person. And like the Disney movie that they did, they kind of sugarcoated everything too. Oh, did yeah. they? Um, yeah. uh, I started watching Hercules and I could not finish it. <laughs> it's so like, I don't know, anciently like incorrect. Well, they, they had to change so many things around that he stops being Hercules. Yeah. Um, for instance, he is actually the child of Zeus and Hera. Mm -hmm. If he had been, his life would have been a whole lot better, <laughs> and probably most of these awful things wouldn't have happened to him. No, Zeus very famously stepped out on Hera all the time. Yeah. He had dozens of illegitimate kids, most of whom became demigods and heroes. They're all demigods, most of them became famous heroes. Um, and so, so Hercules had a mortal mother. Yeah. And now Hera was horribly jealous every time that Zeus did this. Mm -hmm. She schemed to, to kill the, the, the mother and the child. Whoever Zeus had seduced, yeah. she would try to murder. Sometimes she succeeded, um, and the child would also have to pay the price um, of Zeus's infidelity. Um, in this case, when Hera found out what happened, she sent two snakes to kill Hercules in his cradle. Fortunately, his super strength manifested itself really early, and he was able to grab the snakes <laughs> and choke them to death before they could bite him. Which was his mom's first clue that, like, yeah, this boy is not normal. Yeah. Um, also, weirdly, the Disney cartoon, Hades is made the bad guy. Um, <laughs> Hades had almost no interactions with Hercules no. whatsoever. He did go to the underworld to steal something, and Hades was very ticked off about that and mm -hmm. threw him out. But that was to be expected. Yeah. He actually stole Hades' dog. He stole the three-headed dog? He did. He stole Cerebrus right from under Hades' nose. Wow. I mean, yeah. If you watch John Wick, you know what happens you mess with somebody's dog. So, you know, yeah, you just don't do that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so Hercules, incredibly powerful. Um, his life was mostly a horrible tragedy. Mm. Uh, basically, you can sum up Hercules' career by, I've done something awful, how do I make up for this horrible thing that I've done? Um, he had a fit of madness. Okay, he got married, had like several kids, up to eight kids. 
And then he had this fit of madness strike him. Some say that Herod drove him mad. Others say it was something else that happened to him. Um, and eventually he killed his wife and his children. He literally massacred them. And so he naturally is really upset about this. And he wanders the earth trying to find some way to repent, some way to atone for what he's done. And he's finally given in service to an evil king. Um, he's told that if he serves this king and does like 12 labors for him, then he can then he will redeem himself for the, the horrible things that he's done. It doesn't help his dead wife and kid, but hey, you know. There was no justice system in those days, yeah. you might notice. So he went to work for this evil king and assigned 12 tasks, what considered to be impossible tasks. And there's a story behind every one. There's like 12 whole stories. In fact, the king wasn't even satisfied with all of them, so he had to do a couple more tasks on top of that. Wow. It just kept coming and coming. He had to clean out a stable that had never been cleaned before, which he had to do by diverting the course of a river. He had to kill the hydra, um, which, you know, he wow. managed to do eventually, but it was, it was a touch and go did for he, a while. Did he really do that many bad things that, like, you know? He murdered his wife and children. I mean, really, what do you do? So that do? all was just for, like, that one thing? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, all okay. of that. He did worse things later. Okay. But the, the first 12 labors were just for killing his wife and kids. Um, he had to kill a bull. He had to kill a boar, much like Theseus. They said they get confused sometimes. The stories are very similar. Um, so one of the worst things that he did, in my opinion, as a comic book fan, is he also assaulted Wonder Woman's mom. He did? Yeah, it's true. Um, Wonder Woman's mom was Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons, and uh, he was tasked with one of the things he had to do was steal Hippolyta's girdle, which was like this belt that she had. Yeah. And it's always assumed the belt kind of symbolized her like separateness from men and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, in some versions of the story, she seduces her. There's a version of the story where he gets her drunk. In many versions, she just defeats the Amazons and just takes what he wants from her. Yeah. Um, it's pretty awful either way. In some version of the story, after he does the deed, he actually like gives her to his pal Theseus. You know, like it's like a bro thing. Here, have an Amazon queen I'm done with. Um, oh yeah, he was awful, awful, awful. In fact, in the DC comics, he's the whole reason Wonder Woman exists. Because the Amazons were enslaved after that, and they prayed to get their freedom. And when they got their freedom back, they turned on the captors and escaped from Greece. And the goddesses um, gave them an island of their own, off in the middle of nowhere, where they'd be forever separate from the world of men. And that's where they lived for thousands of years, until like Diana was born, and they received contact with the outside world. But in DC Comics, he's the whole reason why. They, 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 they turned their back on every man in the universe because of what Hercules did. That's crazy. Yeah. He just started a whole new thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, he went on to murder other people, other innocent people. Not surprising. Yeah, his fits of madness never left him. Um, some say it was his hair trick or temper. He couldn't, didn't know his own strength. Um, he murdered a bunch of other innocent people, and this time um, he, had, he had to pay for it by going to, he sold him to slavery, mm -hmm. and he went to uh, Queen Lydia of Umphale, um, as he became her slave for a while and did a bunch of tasks for her. They're not nearly as famous as the, um, the famous 12 labors he had to do. Yeah. Um, and in some version of the story, the tax, tasks are kind of weird. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a version of the story in which she dresses him in women's clothing and he has to um, make thread. He has to like use a spinning wheel to yeah. make thread. So basically, she forces him to dress as a woman and do women's chores around her castle. <laughs> it's like she's forced to be carrying of his toxic masculinity, maybe. Yeah. Understandable. Yeah, he certainly deserved yeah. it. Yeah. Um, it's a weird version of it. In other versions, there's a lot of typical things he does, killing monsters and things like that. Monster killing, he was very big at. Like, that's what he's mostly remembered for. People think about Hercules, they think of the monsters that he killed. He killed, I said, all the big ones, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, the Nemedium boar, um, the Hydra, famously, you know. And so because he is like the hero. He went on quests, he killed monsters, and that became the prototype for heroes in like all the Western civilization. Yeah. And you can tell the story of him killing the Hydra without mentioning the awful circumstances that led up to it. You can just tell the story of him killing monsters. Yeah. And so for that reason, his stories are considered fit for kids. So toned down versions have appeared in children's literature since for, for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, the story of the Greek myths was some of the first uh, stories translated into English back when the printing press was invented. 
Um, so he's appeared in comic books. There's a version of Hercules in both DC Comics and Marvel Comics. Um, Marvel Comics glosses over all the bad things that he does. Um, in Marvel Comics, he's positioned as a counterpart to Thor, whereas Thor is more like sober and serious minded, and Hercules is, you know, grab a beer and pat you on the back too hard and you break your shoulder blade kind yeah. of guy. Um, Hercules is a party animal, he's always looking for a babe, looking for a good time, whereas Thor is depicted as more like grim and dour and dedicated to being a hero. And Hercules is just, eh, whatever. <laughs> um, they both served in the Avengers for a while, which was a real powerhouse combo. Wow. Yes, all the Greek gods have popped up at some point in Marvel. Um, and DC Comics has their version of Hercules, though in some of them he redeems himself to the Amazons and they forgive him. There's, a, there's one whole storyline in which um, Diana discovers that one of the pillars supporting Themyscira to keep the island from sinking is actually made of Hercules. He's holding up the island that he's been doing for thousands of years. Yeah. And when he's finally released from that torment, Hippolyta forgives him and sends him on his way. Wow. So, he has been in so many movies. <laughs> um, when Disney announced their Hercules cartoon, it kind of surprised me because there had been a really successful Hercules TV series mm -hmm. that starred Kevin Sorbo. That was on the air for five or six years, and it had only been off the air for like a couple of years when Disney announced the Hercules mm -hmm. thing. Um, See, so, I didn't know that they had a show about it. I only yeah. knew they had a movie. But the Hercules series was great. Um, it was done lighthearted, didn't take itself too seriously. Okay. Um, and this one, he's not responsible for any of the bad things that happen. It's always a curse. It's always someone taking over his body or something like that. So they allow him to have a tragic backstory. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, he's over that. He's dedicated to being doing the right thing all the time. He's very much a dedicated, sober-minded hero. Um, and the, the Xena series, you know Xena? Yes. Yes, Xena was spun off Hercules. Hercules was the first series. Wow. And then she started as a villain on Hercules. And she was so cool and so hot, everybody loved her. And she got her own series after that. Mm -hmm. And her series actually lasted longer than Hercules. Yeah. She kept going after Kevin Sorbo left Hercules and the show was canceled. Um, so uh, movies, tons of Hercules movies. Um, in the 60s when I was a little kid, mm -hmm. they had a bodybuilder named Steve Reeves mm -hmm. who uh, in Italy made a whole series of Hercules films. Which apart from being filmed you know, um, you know, on location in, in yeah. Italy and Greece and so forth, didn't have much going for them. They're really awful movies. They couldn't afford special effects. Um, but uh, they popularized the idea of the strong man hero. Steve Reeves is a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. So he has this great biceps and this yeah. oiled chest and everything, yeah. Like he, a human hero, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. Even Arnold Schwarzenegger, who very early in his career, he spoke English so badly he was dumb, did a Hercules movie. Yeah, it's awful. Oh my God. Um, so yeah, that became pretty much the standard hero type. Hundreds of Hercules movies there have been over the years. Um, and I just was, when I was researching it this morning, I discovered that Hercules um, is going to be Disney's next live action adaptation. Oh, they're making a live version? They're doing a live action oh. version of Hercules. Like, there hasn't already been 50 others, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's the Disney version. It'll be the Disney version. Yeah. So it'll be toned down and nothing bad will happen to him. Um, how do you feel about sort of whitewashing these characters? Um, I think it takes away kind of. I don't know, the whole meaning of it, I guess. Because there's so much tragedy in it. They represent a different culture. Mm -hmm. And because Greece was a very male-dominated culture, yeah. most of the awful things that they did, apart from just blatant murder, were all crimes against women. Yeah. Which wasn't considered a crime in those days. Greece was also a very big fighting place. And kind of yes, yeah. Greece wasn't a country, as I think I mentioned last time. Greece was a collection of city-states that were eternally at war. They would grudgingly join forces um, if, if the Persians invaded it. Aside from that, they were at war with each other all the time. So what they looked up to had to be a dynamic figure, a big guy with a sword in his hand and huge muscles who just went around killing people and killing monsters. That was yeah. the ideal that they lived up to. And then when you kind of wash it down and you kind of just have like a kid-friendly thing, it kind of takes away all from that. So. Yeah, it takes away the tragedy of the backstory, like I said. The fact that Hercules was forced to do the labors because he had committed you know, mm -hmm. this horrible thing that he had done. It gives him that element of tragedy that makes him a stronger character, in my opinion. Yeah, definitely. Um, but when they do that, they also gloss over the evil things that he did that can't be forgiven by today's standards. Mm -hmm. um, so it's unfortunately we live in an age where there's still a lot of toxic masculinity. Sadly, yes. Yeah, and I don't know if the fact that we admire these Greek stories so much 
led to our having our civilization the way yeah. it is today? I, I think it's like the whole like I don't know industry now, like the whole like social media industry, like movies, TV. You know, it's always yeah. it's always about that. So it's always the girl has to follow the guy around. So yeah, no matter it's, what, it's gonna be. It's always gonna be like that. Yeah, sexism is imparted into a lot of things. Oh yeah, it's in the Bible. It's in ancient civilizations, almost as far back as you can go. Yeah. It is definitely very much hardwired into Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. um, the subjugation of women is an important part of it. Um, there was a, a writer named Robert Graves. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote the textbook on Greek mythology that I read when I was in college taking my Greek mythology class. And uh, he was a believer in the white goddess, which was a matriarchal goddess. And he believed that all religion was really matriarchal. You worshiped a mother goddess. And then the religions, and then she was overthrown, and the religions that came after that were all male-dominated religions. Mm -hmm. And so he reinterpreted a lot of the Greek myths as being about the male patriarchy overthrowing the matriarchy, male dominance over the world instead of female dominance. Um, and there's no question abuse of women is a huge part of Greek mythology. Whether that actually symbolizes a broader shift in culture, no one really knows, because archaeologists can't prove there was ever a matriarchy, that there was ever a goddess that was worshipped everywhere, yeah. like the theory states. Yeah. So some of that you might have to take with a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, so that is our, our kind of sad tour of Greek heroes. Went happy, turned sad. Yeah. <laughs> it, got, it got bad fast. <laughs> Definitely. We'll, we'll start next week with another topic, possibly a more cheerful topic. Maybe. We will see. <laughs> no promises. Um, the books that I dragged out here that I still haven't talked about, because this is book talking, mind you, these are the Rick Riordan books. He has taken the concept of the Greek demigod and made it work for modern culture. Yes. Um, Percy Jackson uh, is, is not a horrible sexist jerk. Um, <laughs> the book is full of cool female characters. Um, he does have his weaknesses as a hero. He's very headstrong, and not always the, the, the brightest bulb in the, in the room. Yeah. Um, but he's written a whole cycle of two cycles of stories about him, and he also has done stories about um, um, Egyptian mythology, people who are who are discovered they're swept up in the world of Egyptian myths, and even Norse mythology, um, a very popular series. And he's done crossovers that team up the different characters. Percy Jackson pops up. Um, in the Magnus Chase series as a supporting character. So he built this huge universe for himself, which is very, very cool. And it's proof that you can tell good stories using these old tropes. But you notice when the gods show up in the books, they're mostly still jerks. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, Poseidon, Perse Perseus' father, isn't a horrible monster, but at the same time, he's not there he's for the Percy ever. Yeah, yeah he's just yeah. not. Um, in fact, the whole first story, Lightning Thief, is about Percy trying not to be killed by Zeus. That's the entire premise of the first book. <laughs> All right, so we'll be back next time with more exciting book talking. Bye. I've been Ed. And I'm Miss Gabby. We'll see you next time. Be safe. <laughs>